The uh, topic for today is the mental equivalent. And if you're familiar with that phrase, mental equivalent, it's probably from this little booklet here called The Science of Mind. It is, in fact, the title of chapter 17 of The Science of Mind, Mental Equivalence. And if your entire exposure to mental equivalence is that chapter, you might not be as clear about it as you'd like to be. <laughs> One thing about this book, The Science of Mind, is that it really should have been written in hypertext because everything in it is related to everything else in it. And so, for instance, in the, the chapter on mental equivalence, he has a section called The Prayer of Faith. Perfectly good section, but it would perhaps have been clearer to put it in the chapter on faith rather than the one in mental equivalence. There's always a connection between everything and everything, but it sort of muddies the, what mental equivalence is about. And this is especially true with the law of mental equivalence because it is so closely tied and coupled with the law of attraction, which is the next chapter, that when I first read these, I was saying, well, isn't he just saying the same thing in this chapter as in that one? They are so closely tied that you really have to clarify what the difference is between those two laws. And um, what really helped me was this actual booklet, uh, The Mental Equivalent by Emmett Fox. Now, this particular booklet was published in 1943 from lectures that I guess he gave the year or so before. And he says here, about 20 years ago, I coined the phrase mental equivalent. So this is the guy who actually came up with the idea. Probably a good idea to uh, see what he has to say about it. And in fact, when I told our daughter Monica that uh, the title of this talk is The Mental Equivalent, she asked the perfect NLP question. She asked, of what? And he says here, I want to say that for anything that you want in your life, a healthy body, a satisfactory vocation, friends, opportunities, and above all, the understanding of God, you must furnish a mental equivalent. Supply yourself with a mental equivalent and the thing must come to you. Without a mental equivalent, it cannot come. So, okay, the mental equivalent of the stuff you want in your life. But the, a mental equivalent is not just, I'm gonna be taking my glasses on and off, and yes, there is one missing, it's more comfortable that way. Just get that out of the way. Um, a mental equivalent of something is not just a mental representation of it. That's also an idea you might have gotten from reading the chapter on mental equivalence. There's a bit more to it. Now, Emmett Fox, before he was a divine science minister and a new thought luminary, was an electrical engineer. And that shows up, that background shows up in a lot of his writing. So here he's actually going to define, or start to define, what a mental equivalent is. Now, of course, I borrowed this expression, mental equivalent, from physics and chemistry. And I love that, of course, you know, like, we all knew that. You know. <laughs> he got it from, from physics and chemistry. We speak of the mechanical equivalent of heat, for example, and engineers constantly have to work out the equivalent of one kind of energy in another kind of energy. They have to discover, and these two words are key, these next two words, they have to discover how much electricity they will need to do certain mechanical work. They have to find out how much coal will be needed to produce so much electricity. That's what the equivalent in mental equivalent means. This much is equivalent to that much. And so on. In like manner, there is a mental equivalent, a mental how much, of every object or occurrence on the physical plane. Now, with this key, you can then go back to the chapter on mental equivalence and see that, yes, Ernest Holmes is talking about that when he's talking about mental equivalence at all in that chapter. And listening to the language now, you'll sort of get it. He says here, it must be, listen to the how much words. It must be measured out to us according to our own measuring. We must not only believe, we must know that our belief measures the extent and degree of our blessing. If our belief is limited, only a little can come to us, because that is as we believe. We call this the law of mental equivalence. 
Another quote from that chapter to show how the different laws are different laws. In addition to the law of faith and acceptance, the law of mental equivalence must be considered. These are two great laws. In other words, there are different laws involved in the spiritual science of mind, just as there are different physical laws. There's the law of faith and acceptance. There's the law of mental equivalence. There's the law of attraction. These are all different laws. They work together. Just as you, know, you have the law of gravity, you have laws of electricity, you have laws of aerodynamics. These are all different laws, but you have to consider all of them in order to get a plane to fly. So the law of mental equivalence is the one we'll, we're, discuss, we're especially interested in today. Uh, just a couple more quotes from that chapter. It follows then that the range, how much, of our possibilities at the present time does not extend far beyond the range of our present concepts. As we bring ourselves to a greater vision, to induce a greater concept and thereby demonstrate more in our experience. I have uh, one more quote from that chapter. This is one of Ernest Holmes' favorite metaphors. We plant a seed, and there in the seed, operating through the creative soil, everything that will cause it to develop, unfold, and produce a plant. Now, if I read that quote in different context, I would be talking about different aspects of it. In this particular thing about mental equivalence, the key word here is a. You plant a seed and it will produce a plant. A seed is the seed equivalent of a plant. If you want a whole field of seeds, you have to plant a whole field of plants. If you want a whole field of plants, you have to plant a whole field of seeds. That's the seed equivalent of a field. Now, to use some metaphors and analogies other than ones from farming or electrical engineering, uh, here's one. Let's say you have a car that gets 25 miles to the gallon, and you want to go on a journey. You have a destination that's 100 miles away. Well, you have to supply enough gas to get to where you're going. You have to supply, if you do the math, four gallons of gasoline, at least, to go on a journey of 100 miles. Four gallons is the gasoline equivalent of a destination of 100 miles. If you supply less than that, if you supply two gallons, you won't get there. You'll only get half as far. So again, when you supply a mental equivalent, it has to be equivalent to what it is you want. It's not just an image. It's not just some representation. It has to be enough of a representation to be equivalent to the thing you, you want. One more example is uh, sheet music. I don't know if you actually have sheet music, Mir. I'm pretending you do. Uh, the, the song we heard before, Imagine. In order to have the entire song, you have to have a song's worth of sheet music. If you just had sheet music that had the first four notes, you just have Imagine Theirs. I won't even try and sing it. And that's all you'd have, because that's all you supplied as the sheet music equivalent of the, whole, of the song. You have to supply an entire sheet music for an entire song in order to end up with an entire song. So I hope I've given enough examples there to explain what equivalent, it means equal. It means the same amount. Now, Fox goes on to explain a little bit more about mental equivalence. And I'm taking a drop of water again. So fine, you have to supply enough. How do you do it? Well, he says here, how do you do it? You build, and again, here's a word that he uses over and over again, build mental equivalents. You don't just have them, you build them. You build the mental equivalents by thinking quietly, constantly, and persistently of the kind of thing you want. Thinking has two qualities, clarity or definiteness, and interest, or he'll also substitute the word feeling for that. Those are what he calls the two poles, clarity and interest. Those have to be built into your mental equivalent. And in fact, he says here, 99 times in 100, the reason metaphysical students do not demonstrate is that they lack feeling or interest in their treatments. They speak the truth. Oh, yes, I am divine spirit. I am one with God. But they do not feel it. 
The second ingredient, the second pole, as he calls it, is missing. When they talk about their troubles, they are full of feeling. But when they speak of truth, they are cold. They say, I am divine spirit. And they say it without feeling. But when they say, I have a terrible pain, it is loaded with feeling. And so the pain they get and the pain they keep. To think clearly and with feeling leads to demonstration because then you have built a mental equivalent. So he speaks a little bit more about clarity later on. If your thought is vague, you do not build a mental equivalent. Well, actually, you build a mental equivalent of something vague. Something fu if you have a vague, fuzzy idea of what, you're, what you want, you know, the machinery of the universe, that, that middle section that uh, Holmes refers to as the law or their mind, is going to give you something vague in response. So what does he want? Well, he wants something. I don't, well, give him something. <laughs> Fine, we're done. <laughs> So make your thoughts as clear and definite as possible. And he says, get the thought of what you want as clear as you can, be definite, but not too specific. Because here he's bumping up against that idea of what in New Thought, for reasons passing understanding, is called outlining. How outlining is about being very, very specific. I don't know. But that's what they call it, outlining. So he gives an example here. If you say, I want a house in the country or in the suburbs, and I want it to have a porch and a large yard with trees and flowers. That is all right. And I would add, you know, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, how many closets, what kind of acreage, that sort of thing. But you do not say, I must have a certain house, the one at 257 Ninth Street or 21 Fifth. It's fine. I actually lived at 24 Fifth Avenue, 21 Fifth <laughs> Avenue. I didn't notice that <laughs> when I was going over this. Just one more quote. The doctrine of the mental equivalent is the essence of metaphysical teaching. The doctrine that you will receive that for which you provide the mental equivalent. So, how do you do that? How do you build a mental equivalent now? Well, actually, the words are there. The words are there. You make it more, right? He talked about as much as. He talked about clarity. So most people, when they have a mental representation of something, there are other aspects to it too, but at least some sort of image, some sort of picture of it. So make the picture clear. He's telling you, make it a clear image. Don't make it fuzzy. You've got, maybe you've got glasses and things are fuzzy when you take them off. You all became fuzzy right now. <laughs> right now. But you can adjust the focus of the pictures in your mind without having to put on glasses. So make your pictures clear. Make them rich. Make them something to go for. To make it more of a mental equivalent, make it a bigger picture. It's that simple. I mean, if you want something and you have a picture of it, it's about that big, well, let's hope what you're going for is a postage stamp because that's the equivalent of what, you, what you've been building here. To make it a mental equivalent of something that you really want in your life, you've got to make it bigger. There's a re reason that IMAX movies impact you more than movies on your phone. They give you more input. They give you more to look at. And once it's bigger, then you can put in a rich detail. You can't put in a, a whole lot of detail in something this big. So it's bigger, make it brighter. A brighter image attracts you more. Give it rich colors, rich colors like technicolor colors, not these washed out colors that you see in these artsy movies nowadays. Bright, beautiful, technicolor colors so that you're interested in it. So it, has, it generates that, what he calls that interest. You've got to have some dynamics to it. You've got to be lively. If you, if you have a, a, a little still dead picture of something, you, know, you end up with something little still and dead. I mean, it's got to be lively. It's got to be dynamic. It's got to have some oomph to it. And the more oomph it has, the more oomph in what you're going to be getting. If, let's say you wanted a car and you have this little, little still picture of a car, you know, who knows if that thing's even working? You know, it's, 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 it's got to be a moving picture. You know, and a picture, this, it's a picture of a toy car. You know, on a real car, you have a picture of yourself in the car, driving the car, you feel the motion. 
you hear the motor, you hear, put sounds in your mental representations to make them equivalent to what you want. Not just the sounds that are there, but background music. Put some music into it. Think of it as a movie. You've never seen a movie that doesn't have music. Even silent movies had music. Because they know that that's what brings the mood. That's what brings the interest. And when you have all that interest and all that, that power in it, that's what activates the law of attraction. Once it's something big and bright and beautiful and something that you really, really want, then you become more attracted to it. And that activates the law of attraction. Now, I did leave a, a little something out, and that is, before you start building the mental equivalent of what you want, well, whatever you have in your life now that you don't want, you've built a mental equivalent of that. You have built some sort of big, bright picture of stuff that's going on in your life, whatever it is, that you don't want. So you have to get rid of that first. Think of the song again, uh, Imagine. First it was talking about imagine some things being gone before saying, and now imagine all the people living life in peace. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. First get rid of all the other stuff. Now, how do you do that? Well, here, from my experience, both Ernest Holmes and Emmett Fox don't get it quite right. That's right. That's right. Everybody is, is not infallible. I'm not infallible. Unless I'm wrong about that, but I don't think so. <laughs> had to throw that in. I debated. But he says here, if we lack, if we are poor, if we should be, if we are without friends, if we are without opportunity, we should be sure to erase from our consciousness any sense of lack. So far, so good. Or there's a little twist you have to put on that, but we'll get to it. We erase thought from consciousness by pouring in an opposite thought. Now that's just simply not true. I've worked with humans a long time and that's not the way they operate. We'll, we'll get to it in a second. I just want to show that even the metaphor he has here is not right. It rubs it out just as we rub out a chalk mark off of a board. Now think about it. Let's say you had written on a blackboard the word lack, and you wrote over it abundance. You just have two things up there now. It's confused and confusing. You have to erase, you have to get rid of the first one first before you put in the second one. Putting in the second one doesn't get rid of the first one. And a, a simple uh, example of that that we all have, I assume everybody here has a phone number. And I assume that if I asked most of you what your phone number is, you could tell me, right? It's the first one that comes to mind. But I also assume that everybody here has had other phone numbers in their lives. And I would bet that if I asked you what was your phone number before this one, or maybe one from even 20 or 30 years ago, you could tell me. They're still there. The only way to actually get those numbers out of your head is through surgery. <laughs> Literally, brain surgery is the only way to get them out. They're there, but they're not the ones you go to. They're old, they're pushed to the side. You put the new one up front, that's the one that you go to when someone asks you what's your phone number. And that's what you do with the mental equivalence that you've built of stuff that's in your life now that you don't want. You push it off to the side. How do you do it? Exactly the opposite process. You make it small. You make it dim. You have the muted colors or just black and white. You push it off to the side, little sounds if, if there are any at all. Then you build a big, bright, beautiful thing of what you want. Which one are you going to start thinking about? The big, bright, beautiful thing, right? You're not going to think about this little thing. I mean, it, it can come up upon occasion, just like the old phone number can, if something triggers it. But in, in most cases, that's what you got. You got this big, bright, lively, dynamic thing going on in your head. That's what's going to end up going on in your life. It has to. It just has to. I'm going to tell you, when I started not even working on this particular uh, talk, when I just started thinking about, you know, a talk on mental equivalence would be good because there's some confusion about it. I started building mental equivalence like all over the place. I have them all over my house. They're big as a house. Literally, they're, they're actually, they're, they're up on the mountains. I see these big, bright, beautiful things about what I want. And since I started doing that, since I started doing that particular spiritual practice, things have been happening. 
things have been moving, things have been churning in my life, like never before, like all the years before when I would do treatments, when I would ask for treatments, because I never built more than some sort of vague, fuzzy mental equivalent. Now that I've got the big, bright, clear, detailed ones, things are happening. And so I just leave you with the thought, go thou therefore and do likewise. Thank you. <laughs>